guys, today's Pentecost Sunday. It is the, it is the church's birthday today. Uh, or I should say the church as we know it. And there's a few, few different things that I want to cover. Um, this might not be the most traditional Pentecost Sunday message, um, which I'm okay with, but uh, just to give you a heads up. But I, I want us to enter into what this day is about. And I want us to just pause for a moment and think and realize that you're here today, you're in this room, because over 2,000 years ago, God poured out his spirit and some people, 120 people praying in an upper room over in the Middle East, the, these no-name people got filled with the spirit of God and God turned the world upside down through them and we are here as a result of what God poured out 2,000 years ago. And I want to draw our attention to that for at least a couple of reasons. We'll cover lots of ground today, but in today's day and age, particularly in America, and particularly when you're a believer in America, it's very easy to look at everything that's going on in the world and to get discouraged, to say, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? Um, especially those of us who are older come from different generations, and we've sort of seen a moral decline happen in our nation. You're looking around going, God, where, where are you? What are you doing? What's happening? One of the beautiful things about Pentecost is it is a reminder. Empires, governments, the work of the enemy, sin, death, destruction, could not squash out the kingdom of God for 2,000 years. It could not squash out the kingdom of God for 2,000 years. And while things may not look good right now, you can rest assured that the kingdom of God was here before you entered the earth and it will be here after you leave. Amen. Amen. So Jesus, help me today. Amen. Amen. Um, and one of the, if I could sort of encapsulate one of the big points that I want you to take home today or one of the ways that I want us to start thinking or incorporate, integrate into our thinking about the kingdom of God is this, is that the kingdom of God, this will offend you and it's on purpose, the kingdom of God is small. The kingdom of God is small and it starts small. It grows, it expands, but it is small. And why is this important? Most of us in the traditional ways of thinking about Pentecost, we think about fire, we think about the gift of tongues, we think about these big encounters that lead to immediate big fruit. But I would propose to you that in the grand scheme of history, what God sowed in Pentecost was actually a small seed. Well, come on, Aaron. Yeah. It was a small seed. If you're there, and you're, again, the, this story, and we'll, we'll read some scripture here in a moment, the story is that Jesus goes up to be with the Father, and he gives the disciples, the 120, he gives them this command, he gives them the Great Commission, he says, you know, this is your mission, go into all the world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. He lays out how it's going to happen. Go to, you'll be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and then to the outer parts of the earth, which to take a little short sidetrack to look at that, most of us in the way that we think that the kingdom of God is explosive and big, which it is, there's a paradox here. We, th we would think, you know, if we were in charge, pour out the Holy Spirit, immediately send this thing worldwide, immediately let Jesus come back in like five or so years, which is ultimately how the disciples were thinking. But the way that God has ordained the kingdom to work and the way that he chooses to move is that he sows a seed and he lets that thing grow and expand, slowly, slowly building over time. There are revivals, there are seasons of renewal where the kingdom of God is immediate and explosive and expansive and we love those and we long for that. The issue is, is that when your view of the kingdom of God is limited to that, 
you look at your life in the in-between. You look at your life in between encounters. You look at your life in between these Pentecost moments. And because it's not big and explosive, you start saying, God, what am I doing wrong? And in reality, God's looking at you saying, there's literally nothing wrong. I think he asks us another question. He says, I did fill you and I did encounter you. So what are you doing with what I deposited in you? <laughs> and I'm talking to you as somebody who's been in that line of thinking before. I know what it, I, and trust me, like I've had those moments, I've had those encounters with God where it, you, it's hard to explain, but it's literally like heaven's so close, you could just reach out and grab it, where everything in a moment starts to make sense, where people who have been sick for years, crippled for years, are starting to get healed right in front of you, and you're like, this, I could get used to this. <laughs> but what can happen is, and what does happen, is God's not just interested in you having one explosive encounter and then not being able to steward the seed he put in you. Most of the time we end up chasing after encounter after encounter because we got used to what it felt like to have God so close and we're like all, and in reality we're just, we are so uncomfortable with being uncomfortable that we're saying, God, I need you to meet me how you did back then because at that point, everything felt right, everything felt aligned inside of me, and I wanna feel that. I don't wanna feel the mess of trying to learn how to run and steward my life to actually sustain and carry what you put inside of me. I understand that. I understand how uncomfortable it is to Go away to a conference, go away to a camp, or even in your private time. Jesus comes and he meets you. He breathes on you. The Spirit fills you. And it's amazing. And you're like, God, I just want to live here. And then you turn around and you have to go back to your normal life. But I would say that that's actually how God set it up to work. We'll read this here in the text in a moment. But the Spirit was poured out so that we could have power to follow Jesus and to witness to the rest of the world to the resurrection of our King. So when we relegate the filling of the Holy Spirit, the, the moments he encounters us, when we relegate it to just, I need to feel good and I need to get my spiritual fix for the week, when we relegate it to just that, we are selling ourselves and selling the Holy Spirit disparagingly short. I could keep riffing on this, but I'm going to read. <laughs> I'm going to read starting in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, and then I'm going to go into chapter 2. This is after the resurrection, and it says, While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. Something that the Lord has been making apparent to me most of the time in just the, again, the sort of Western way of looking and looking at and doing Christianity where everything's about it. it needs to be big all the time. We need to be winning all the time. You know, if I was able to see five people healed last week, it needs to be 20 next week. And if five people got saved the week before, I'm failing. If it's not 30 the week after what we 
start to get locked up in in that way of thinking as we look at encounters from the Holy Spirit and fillings from the Holy Spirit as rewards for doing enough. Which is why I believe Jesus said, I've given you the call, I've given you the command, now you go back to the city and you sit and you wait and you do not move until I release power on you. He wanted it to be very, very clear. His presence in our lives is not a reward for working hard enough. And we will amen messages like this all day. But when we look at our lives, does our being with Jesus match the amount of doing for Jesus that we're doing? And don't hear that phrase as a way to guilt us into like, yeah, I just need to be praying more. I need to be reading more. I'm not doing enough, blah, 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 blah. No, knock that off. That way of thinking, that way of thinking about your devotional time with the Lord, again, from personal experience, is anything but fruitful. It reinforces this idea that if I just strive more, my life will work. And if I strive more, God will be pleased with me. He'll zap me with enough power to do all the stuff that I'm doing. Meanwhile, the father's back here saying, I never actually asked you to go over there and do that. Back here with me is where peace is. Back here with me is where affirmation is. And if you'll sit here and wait here, I will breathe on you. I will release the promised Holy Spirit on you when you wait and then you go. Many times we engage in ministry activity. We witness to our friends. We start to pray for people in the workplace. We get words of knowledge. We do all of this stuff. We do what we know how to do. And then when we don't see the results that we think we should be seeing, which can be a form of idolatry. Let me just leave that there. When we don't see the results that we think we should be seeing, we immediately go into self-suspicion. God, what am I not doing? What's going on? What's happening? And we, in the middle of that, go into more and more striving, not realizing again that the Father said, sit back and wait. If that's the model that he gives us in scripture with the disciples when the church was birthed. I don't think he's interested in changing that anytime soon. Now the other side of this ditch, if I can put it that way, is that we're so uncomfortable with moving, we'll, we'll baptize our uncomfortability with going out there and taking risks and call it waiting on the Lord. I've been in both places. But the invitation, again, and what the way that the church was birthed, and again, the, the way that something starts is so important, and it speaks to how the whole thing is supposed to operate. How many of you guys have been in a wacky relationship before? <laughs> you can look back, and you can look at the way that that thing started, and if you're honest with yourself, you can say, I could tell you by the way that that started, where I was in my own heart when that started, where I was in my mind when that thing started. I could have told you, looking back, I could have told you, yeah, there's no way that's going to go well. <laughs> so the father is so careful and so intentional. He said, I'm not going to say, you go out and start working, and once I see that you need to pick me up, then I'll give you something. I want to enforce in them for the thousands of years that this is going to go on after this moment, that they get empowered from a place of rest. The other thing that it reinforces when God empowers us from a place of rest and then releases us to go, it enforces that God's not after what you can do for him. If it was really about the results that we think we can give to God, then he would have said, go, 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 go. You can rest when you get to heaven. Yeah. How many of us have said that before? 
not realizing that when we engage in that way of thinking and living, it actually dehumanizes us. Do you realize that your Sabbath time, do you realize that your rest with the Lord, heaven looks more like that than it looks like ministry time? Aaron, I don't know. That sounds nice, but I don't know. Cool. Let me talk to you about it. What we engage with in ministry, whether that's teaching, preaching the word, prayer, prayer for the sick, deliverance, all of those things exist because sin, death, and destruction exists in the world. Specifically, when I'll say specifically things like teaching, things like prayer for the sick, deliverance. Prayer, if prayer is talking to the Lord, that's going to exist when heaven comes. So let me correct that really quickly. But all of those things exist that where we, like, we see heaven breaking in, which it is heaven breaking in, but we think that it's in the doing. When Jesus is here and he kicks out sin, he kicks out sickness, he kicks out death, there's not going to be any sick people for me to lay my hands on. There's not going to be a prophetic word for me to release because Jesus is right there talking to me. This is 1 Corinthians 13, by the way. What will heaven look like? Heaven will look like us in the fullness of relationship and communion with God. Resting. Because there's not more ministry for us to do. It's a little off topic, but I like where we ended up there. <laughs> he told them to wait. Another point that I'll pull out from the text, it's in verse 7, verses 6 and 7. The disciples are asking him, hey, Jesus, like, is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom, of, kingdom to Israel? They're thinking about a physical kingdom. <clears throat> They're talking about what most of us would call the end times or eschatology. And I love Jesus' response. He says, it's not your job to worry about that. And he leaves it there. Good. Scripture does tell us to be discerning. It tells us to be aware of the signs of the times. But so often, we get, many of us will get caught up in looking for when Jesus is coming back that we miss even the heart of the Father, the heart of Jesus when he's talking to his disciples about this, he says, the exact date and time, not your job to worry about. Let me tell you what is. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. We know that he's coming back. We labor with the sense of urgency knowing that he is coming back and he could come back at any moment. But our lives and our hearts and our minds were not meant to be consumed with, he's going to come back any minute, he's going to come back any minute, he's going to come back any minute. The Father is good, and it's not for us to worry about exactly when he's coming back, but he has given us people to love. He's put us in a specific context to re represent and release the kingdom. And our call is to do that until he comes back. I'm going to jump ahead to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, 
They're drunk on new wine. Pause there. We, we see immediately that as soon as the promise from the Father, the Holy Spirit comes and releases power into the lives of the disciples, they didn't really have to try very hard after that point. They're filled to overflowing and what comes out is this miracle of the gift of tongues and this miracle of hearing. Scholars debate exactly you know, how that plays out, but again, the point is the Spirit comes the promise of the Father comes, power is released on them, and it starts flowing out of them. And they can't help but start to proclaim the gospel to the people that are around them. Anytime we enter into striving, anytime we find ourselves, we could use a bunch of different terms here, working ourselves to the bone, anytime we find ourselves working till we're dropping, that should be an indication for you to slow down. That's not to say that the gospel or the kingdom of God is opposed to diligence or hard work. I'm not saying that at all. But when your body and your soul are telling you to slow down, slow down. Another thing that jumps out to me just from this text is it seems like to the religious people gathering around them, they're seeing what's going on. And they're so confused and I would say offended by what's happening that all they can say is, these guys are just drunk. And there's a couple things here. Number one, those of us who are uncomfortable with the movement of the Holy Spirit uh, in miraculous ways or in manifestations of the Spirit, to use that terminology, uh, this passage is something you've got to deal with. The, the, very, the very sanitized way of looking at this passage is like, oh, they were just delivering, you know, they were just preaching the gospel in these other known languages, which, again, I could argue a little bit if you want to split hairs on theology. So there's nothing to, like, you know, I see these people acting like they're drunk in these services, they're calling it the Holy Spirit, but I don't know, like, I, I just, let's just slow down for a second. If I just... If you know that I shouldn't be speaking your dialect, like if I, if I come up to you and I start preaching in Tagalog, you're going to go, that's weird. You're not going to assume that I'm drunk. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So however the Spirit is moving in the lives of these people in this moment, they're overcome in a way, common sense would dictate, that looks like they're intoxicated. I just made so many of you uncomfortable, and I'm so okay with that. <laughs> now, there is, we'll, we'll see manifestations of the Spirit, and they'll make us uncomfortable because we have baggage that comes to that encounter. We'll have, many of us have seen people who, again, just seek after that encounter, that seek after that particular manifestation. We see the unhealth that comes with it, and we end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We say, oh, if people who experience that and see that act like this. I don't want to act like that. Therefore, I shouldn't, I should just dismiss anything that looks like that. Can I tell you that the religious spirit would love for you to do that? <laughs> Can I tell you that the religious spirit would love for you to do that? I'll put this another way. If the God that you worship and follow never does anything that blows your mind, If the God that you worship and follow, which again, let's even take a couple of steps back here. We're saying that the man we follow was murdered and came back to life. But we're uncomfortable with the idea that something supernatural could happen in a way that makes us uncomfortable and scratch our heads. Can we just talk about how much that doesn't make sense? <laughs> as you pursue Jesus, as you pursue the Holy Spirit, as you wait on him to let him fill you, what Pentecost teaches us is that he will do things that offends you, 
and he will do things that stretches your brain. <coughs> I've seen the Lord do some stuff that's just weird. It's miraculous, it's awesome, but it's weird. One that comes to mind, and again, it's just like, it's really awesome that it happened, but it's odd. Like, it, but it so communicates the heart of the Father. I'll just share it. The, I was ministering at a youth camp one time, and I was just calling some things out as I just heard the Lord saying it. And there was just this testimony that went through my head of the, these ladies who had been like very much into self-harm, self-destruction, but God had healed them and actually like their, their scars got healed. I, and I was just, that was a fleeting thought, and I just said, like, yeah, and, and I just shared the testimony, not even expecting anything. When I tell you that the next morning, two to three different girls came up and were like, uh, all the, the cuts are gone. All the cuts are gone. And here's why, like, that's an amazing thing. It's not offensive in the same way of, like, people walking around like they're drunken, which should be a very, you know, godly, serious, and orderly church service. It's a prayer meeting. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Acting happy over there. But, but the way that we tend to think about our mistakes is we're really okay with the Lord forgiving us, but we think that we need to like really, you know, bear the weight of what we did. So God, like we, we would see those scars and We'll even sanitize it a little bit. We'll be like, yeah, that's, the, that's the, my testimony. Look what I used to do. And that's true and that's good. But when God shows up and is like, no, when I, when I say I'm redeeming everything, that includes the way that your physical body has been hurt and marred by the choices that you used to make. So that starts to get us, again, a little bit uncomfortable. God will do things that will weird you out and will offend you and praise God. <laughs> if you say you're following God, but you, you never go any place new, who are you following? That's not to say that he doesn't keep us in sometimes prolonged holding patterns. But if you're camping around the same issue over and over and over again, and there's no, and, and hear me here, I'm not talking about perfection, but there's no even, there's not even a stumbling forward Who are we following at that point? I'll, and I'll, I'll say this another way as well. Man, I've been talking for a while, geez. I'll, I'll say it another way. Um, discernment, the gift of discernment, and you feeling uncomfortable are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. God's actually very okay with you feeling uncomfortable. Because he knows where he's taking you. If God was, let's go back to scripture here. Probably a good idea. If God was concerned about how comfortable people felt when he showed up, he wouldn't have showed up on Mount Sinai with smoke and lightning and fire. Because if you read that portion of scripture, what you actually see is that Israel was so freaked out that they basically offered up Moses as a, somebody's probably going to die if they go up there and it might as well be you, but it's not going to be me. <laughs> if God was very concerned about how comfortable you were when he showed up, he probably wouldn't have done that that way. And to put it in very practical terms with, like, let's just use working out as an example. 
If you say you're working out, but you never sweat. <laughs> if you say you're lifting weights, but you never get sore. You're probably not growing. <laughs> so if the God you worship never makes you uncomfortable, you probably inserted yourself in that slot at some point. So what am, I, what am I getting at here? Again, took a bunch of rabbit trails, went a bunch of places that I wasn't expecting to go, but here we are. Um, the, the beauty of Pentecost is that God does not expect us to fulfill the mission he gave us on our own. He does not compromise on the call that he's put on you but he also will not compromise on, I am empowering you. I will give you the power to do what I've asked you to do. He looked 120 people dead in the eye and said, you will go to Judea and then Samaria and then to the outermost parts of the earth. He did not compromise on the fact that he was telling 120 people, you will evangelize the whole world. And he gave them the empowerment to match what he called them to do. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Oftentimes we will look at what we can do in our own power and we'll look at what we know God has said to us and we will begin to minimize what God has said so that it can match what we feel we can do on our own. I would challenge us to look at it from the opposite perspective. I know where I'm at. I know what he's called me to do. Look where he's taking me. Look where he's taking us. This should stir something in you. This should stir some hunger in you. This should stir some comfort in you. Because here's the thing, those things that make you weep, those things that make you angry, with that righteous indignation that you see in the world around you, that you feel powerless to speak to, I would say from one perspective, you are, and thank God, because his power comes over the top of weakness. Those things that he's stirring in you, those, those family members that are far from God, those friends that you know, like if they could just meet Jesus, if they could just see who he is for a moment, but you feel so powerless to penetrate the, the walls that they've put up. Those things, I would say, are actually an invitation saying, God, fill me and empower me for that. Fill me and empower me for that. So for some of you, the invitation and the call today is that you have not actually come to the Lord and said, hey, you told us to wait to be filled with your spirit. You said that it was actually better, Jesus, that you should leave so that I could send the promise of the Father. You said of yourself, Jesus, that you were the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I've not sought you as that person. For some of you, the invitation today is begin to seek that. Some of you, I believe, are going to be filled even this morning because he's just that good and he's way more eager to fill people than we are to see them filled. And for some of us, the other side of that coin is you've received a lot already. What are you doing with what you've been given? Your Bible says, to him who has, more will be given. To him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Kingdom principle, how does it apply to this? When you own what God's given you and actually begin to use it and steward it and give it away, he pours out more. But when you take the seed that he's given you, hide it, Store it away. Parable of the talents, you bury it. Even that bit that you have will be taken. And again, condemnation likes to come in on the backside of messages like this and say, yeah, you need to try harder, you need to do more. God is very okay 
and very experienced in dealing with the mess of us stumbling forward. But stumble forward. Amen. 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 Got lots more I could say, but I want to make room for us uh, to be able to pray for some people. So could you please stand? I also just remembered we get to do communion today. We can all handle standing for communion, yeah? Is that okay? We can manage that? (laughs) Ushers, I'm going to... Awesome, you guys are already on it. You're starting to work on it. Um, It was brought to my attention by uh, somebody in the congregation the last time that we did communion that we didn't have time to pause and reflect and... Um, repent even and just allow the Lord to bring stuff to our attention uh, before we went in and that was super valid and I was actually very grateful that they brought that up there's a chunk of scripture where Paul's writing to a church and he says that because you have not correctly discerned the body and blood of the Lord basically saying you haven't honored the communion table and you've taken it in an unworthy manner. That's why many of you have died or have fallen asleep. So we're going to pass the communion elements, but what we're going to do here before we fully move on is we're just going to have some silence. This is a moment for if you've got something in your heart that you know you haven't dealt with, just deal with it now. If the person that you're sitting next to, you had a fight with this morning and you need to do some repenting, do that now. But we're going to take a few minutes in silence here and just allow the Lord to speak to us, get our hearts right before we take communion. So Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you that even though the cost was high, you paid it freely. Jesus, we thank you for your broken body that brings healing to ours. 
that brings peace between us and God. We take the bread now remembering what you did. that washes us clean. Permanently and thoroughly clean. We thank you that your blood is powerful and perfect enough to wash it away, to wash sin, death, and destruction away. And to know that we're freely and completely forgiven. That our sin hasn't just been coated over, it's actually been burned out. So Jesus, we take the cup and we thank you for your blood that you shed. We're gonna just create some space here. Um, I, I do believe that there are some of you who the Lord wants to fill today. He wants to meet in power. He wants to give you the types of encounters that we were talking about today. I do believe that for some of you, he wants to do that. So I'm just gonna pray. I'm gonna invite the Holy Spirit to come. Um, and then I just want you to receive and pay attention to what's happening inside of you and on your body. For some of you, you could start to feel what feels like electricity or power flowing through you, through you. Some of you, it might be that you get struck with a peace that you didn't feel when you walked in. You could feel heat, warmth. It could be tears. None of them are more spiritual or more powerful than the other. These are just ways that we've seen that the Lord starts to move on people when he's highlighting them. So... I'm going to call the, I'm going to pray, and then we'll wait. And as you start to feel the Lord moving on you, I want you to come forward, um, and then we'll have some more instructions, and we'll sort of move forward from, from there. So, Holy Spirit, we just thank you, and we invite you to come. God, we ask that you would empower. We'd ask that you fill. We ask for fresh impartations today, Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for your power. Jesus, we trust you as the one who baptizes in the Spirit. So Jesus, we ask you to walk into the room and do what you do best. <laughs> 